Hi, welcome to how to build an app with AI. In this part, I'm going to show you how to take an app idea and build it inside Cursor. Now, the best part is that you can use this process to build app after app after app. Oh, by the way, if you're just joining us right now and you want to learn the skills leading up to this part, just check out the playlist right over here. All right, let's dive right in. So first off, what are we building? It's a tip calculator. Now, I know that's not terribly exciting, but hear me out. There's actually a lot of little nuances to something like this. Let's put it this way. If I was teaching you how to code, I would not choose a tip calculator as a first app. But with AI, yeah, let's do it. And like I said before, you can use this process to build any app idea. So just keep that in mind. All right, moving on. Now, before we jump into the tip calculator build, I do want to mention one thing first. If you've been following along in this series, back when we're setting up Cursor, we're installing Cursor extensions, and we're also installing homebrew formulas to set up our dev environment. Now, Chris Parker from our community brought up a really good point, and that is that there are malicious extensions out there, so you have to be careful what you install. Make sure it's from a trusted source. I would Google it, make sure that there's no security risks or previous incidents with the extension and things like that. So just to be safe, I was double checking what we installed for this process. And that is SweetPad. It's widely used by iOS developers to streamline their workflow and there's no recorded security incidents with it. Swift is maintained by the SwiftLang community with no known security issues. Those were the two cursor extensions that we installed. We also installed a whole bunch of homebrew formulas. So this one, Xcode build server, no known security issues, being part of the core tap further reduces risk. iOS deploy, it's widely reviewed, no known security incidents. XC beautify, no reported security issues, high usage and inclusion. And Swift format, no known vulnerabilities, widely adopted. So to sum it up, everything that we talked about using in this series has the green flag, it's all good, but still pays to be aware. Don't install extensions from shady sources and things like that, double check first. All right, now back to the tip calculator build. So the first step is we have to create this requirements document, put it inside instructions.md. This way, when we prop cursor, we can refer to the build steps in here and have cursor build it step by step. So this requirements document was generated by this prompt, which I'll leave in the description below. You are an experienced iOS app developer who explains things in grade five level English without technical jargon. I wrote it specifically this way because otherwise it would generate a document for a professional developer and there's going to be a lot of things technical. It's hard to understand, especially if you don't know how to code. So I tried to create this prompt where you can read it in as much plain English as possible. So at a high level, there's the app overview. There's the goals of the app. This is user stories, which is different scenarios that the user can do in the app. There's specific features and then what screens there are. This section will be useful later when we try to use AI for design. This describes how the data is stored, any extra details you might have, and then the actual steps to build it. And then down here is where you put the app idea. Now, I will say the more detailed you can be about the app idea, the more fleshed out the idea is, the more this document will reflect what's in your head. Because if you just use a single sentence, like for example, here, I have a tip calculator that lets the user enter a bill amount, choose a tip percentage, see the total amount, and split it between multiple people. I mean, that's great, but I could probably describe, you know, do I want a setting screen? Do I want like light and dark theme? Do I want this and that? If you don't provide enough AI, will actually start to fill out different features for you. The good thing is that you can then edit it for things that you don't want because we're not just going to copy and paste this into cursor. All right, so what we're gonna do is open your AI of choice. So you can use Claude. I'm just gonna use ChatGPT right here and it's gonna go ahead and generate it. So we can talk about it as it's being generated. There are some goals. Like you can definitely edit this because this is just generating off of what it thinks. These are the different things that the user will be able to do. Again, you can edit it, different features. It's great that it shows some scenarios, like if the bill is empty, then show $0. Or if the user picks zero people, set it to one. These sort of edge cases, if it's not specified, then 
the AI will either not handle the edge case or it will handle it incorrectly. Main screens. So it is just saying one screen. You know, I've generated this requirements document for tip calculator a couple of times now. And each time it's a little different. There was one requirements document where it had a setting screen. It looks like this time it's only having a main screen. So that's what I'm saying. The more you can describe your app idea, the better result you'll get. Okay, so some extra details. No internet should be needed. All data is stored on the device. Okay, works on all iPhone screen sizes. Okay, build steps. So this is what is important because we are going to be asking cursor, hey, let's build step one, two, three, four, five, all the way to 10. But we're not just going to speed run it from one to 10. We are going to go through three different steps for each of these build steps. Number one is telling cursor to build it. Number two is testing it out to make sure it did its job correctly. And if it did, number three would be to either using source control to save your work, essentially save the state. Or if you're not using source control to just create a copy of the folder, which I'll show you how to do this way. If at any point your project completely breaks, you have a good working copy and you're not going to lose that much work, probably just the previous step. All right, so let's go ahead and copy and paste this. So actually it didn't obey my instructions completely because my prompt said to format this document in Markdown and Markdown, you'll see it lets you copy and paste it. Show it to me in Markdown. All right. So this is more like code as text. It's just the document formatting. So you can hit copy and you can directly paste it. Whereas here, if you try to copy this, it actually doesn't copy the bullets. I don't know if you've tried this before, but it's really, it's quite annoying because then you're going to have to format it as a list afterwards, but make sure it's fully generated before you hit copy. All right. So it's done generating it in Markdown and hit copy. And then here I'm going to delete all of this and then paste in my new requirements doc. So now we're ready to move on to the next step. So now we're going to open up the AI panel and the terminal panel or console panel down here. And we're going to give context to the instructions.md file. Make sure you save it first and then hit that. And then we're literally going to ask it to build a step B-001. Say that. And it's going to do its thing. But this is actually just creating a new Swift UI project. And we've already got that. So let's hit stop. Perfect example. Let's go back because we already have a project and I wasn't actually reading the requirements document. So we should actually just start with step 002. Let's go ahead and do that. Let's just change that. I don't want it to create a new project. It didn't change anything. Did it? So main screen, it's going to analyze all of the project structures. Let's see. This is relatively, actually, we will be able to see something. So the nice thing is that there's reference numbers to everything. If you search S-001, you're going to be able to see, oh, that's US, that's user stories. That's not the thing. Screens here. That's the only screen we have. That's the main screen. So it's going to start building this. It's probably going to add the title, the text box, the buttons, the stepper, all of that stuff. We're going to hit keep, and then we are going to launch this and take a look. So when you hit this play button, it's going to launch the simulator. But if it's the first time you've ever tapped it, you're going to see a little menu drop down asking you what iOS simulator later you want to use and you want to choose what whatever one makes sense. So I usually just choose the latest iPhone Pro. I'm going to launch this guy and then we're going to see what that screen looks like. And this is another thing where every time you do this, you get a little bit of a different result as well, because this just describes what is on the screen. It doesn't describe how to position anything. Like this looks different from the last time I did it and it looks kind of broken and bad, right? But we'll solve that later with, with our design. So right now, step or build step 002 is all about just adding the elements on the screen. Uh, I doubt any of this is actually functional unless it just like zoomed ahead and tried to do stuff. Okay. So that looks good. Remember the three steps we're going through is prompted to build it. Number two, test it, which we've done in the simulator here. And once we get to the parts where you actually have logic, testing will become a little more involved because you want to just make sure that the app functions correctly. Right now it's just built the UI. Does it look relatively like everything's there? Yes. Okay. So in my eyes, that's a pass. Number three is save it. So 
I will create a separate video on using source control in GitHub, even if you're non-technical. So we'll go through that together. Uh, but the easiest way for you to do it in a non-technical way is just to create a copy of your folder. So this is test cursor. This is my project here on the desktop. I am going to just hit command D, make a copy of it and label it the last step that I successfully tested this build for. So that was step two. And then we're going to keep doing the same thing. I'm going to tell it now to build B-003. It's going to do its thing. And then I'm going to go through the testing and then saving step, just these three steps across all 10. So I'm going to zoom ahead because it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. And I will show you what we get. Now, actually, I will, before we do that, I'll, I will mention one thing, and that is that when you test it, let's say it, it's built step B003, right? And you're testing it by launching it in the simulator. If you get a build error right here, some red text, it just fails to launch. There's some mistake. And in this case, it's build succeeded, but sometimes you get red text and it won't launch. So then what you want to do is add context to the launch terminal right here. And you're going to go down here to terminals. You're going to choose launch and then you're going to just say, hey, I'm getting an error or just error. Hit enter and it's going to try to fix it, guide you through it. And that's when you're going to get back on track. Now, if it can fix it, like you've done this a few times and it just can't get it to build successfully and launch, then that's probably when you want to consider rolling back to one of your good copies. And the way you do that would be this is your working copy, right? You would just delete this and then you would just take your last good working copy and, and remove this part and use that as your new folder. That's the non-tech source control. All right, but you really should learn how to use GitHub because it is going to be really helpful for you, even if you don't know how to code. So where are we here? We have, we're testing step B003. So this is add the bill amount input and link it to the data. So actually it already had that. So I'm just going to go through these steps, like I said before, and I will join you back up in the last step. Okay, we're back. So I just ran through all 10 steps, but I haven't launched it after it did step 10. Before we do that together, I do want to mention a couple of things. Cursor and AI in general, they're changing so fast that I didn't point out this context usage because this thing is new, but it's really, really helpful. So I mentioned before that all models have like a context window, just a certain amount of things that they can keep in mind while processing your request. You can think of this as a bucket. And you know how every time you make a prompt, you are telling to reference files, you're telling it to reference different screenshots. And then also as it's processing your request, it's also searching for different things in your project. So it's always adding information to give itself context so that it can perform your request. Well, once this gets to 100%, something's got to give. So it's going to start I don't know how it determines what to lose context on. When it reaches 100%, you may want to consider switching to a new chat or once you're not getting the results that you want. The other thing I want to mention, actually, I have mentioned this in the previous parts, it are these two toggles right here between agent modes. So agent is usually when you're like doing stuff and ask is usually when you're asking stuff or trying to get information. In terms of which model, you want to use different models are suited for different tasks. Some are suited more for complex tasks. Some are suited more for vague tasks. So maybe do some Googling because these models are changing so fast that I think anything I say now will be outdated in an instant. Also, they cost different amounts of cursor credits. So that's something to keep in mind as well. You can leave it as on auto, if things are working well, it's going to choose the best model for the job, which is probably what I would recommend if this is all new to you. Okay, so now let's run the project and see what we get for step 10. Actually, I should have been explaining all of that stuff while I was launching the simulator, but I think it'll be pretty fast. So let's see. Let's take a look. Okay, here we go. So we have the bill mount. So let me put my cursor in here, put in 100. I can't dismiss the keyboard though, so that's the problem. And let's choose 10%. Number of people would be two people. All right. Pretty simple. 120, 60 per person. If there's three, it's 40 per person. Yeah. It'd be nice to be able to add a custom tip percentage, right? 
that isn't something that we put into the features or not something that we thought about, but yeah, works as expected except the keyboard. So let's prompt cursor to fix that. So I might say that I want to be able to tap on the view inside of the text field in order to hide the keyboard. And actually testing it on the simulator is different slightly from an actual device. So maybe if I ran this on a real device that this behavior would be inherent because the keyboard does behave a little differently in the simulator. Like you saw when I first put my cursor into this text field, this didn't pop up because you have a keyboard connected, right? So you can type in different things. I had to manually hit this shortcut key for the keyboard, which is command K. Here it is, command K, this one. And that showed this. So that might be why I can't dismiss it, but let me see. So let's run this. Oh, let's see. Yeah, okay, so it's gonna do its thing. The other thing I wanted to show you actually which wasn't completely relevant for this prompt is that sometimes if you see a visual glitch, so do you remember back when we did step 002 that the percentage, like I think some of them, the percentage symbol was below the number. So in cases like that, it's better to give cursor a visual context of what you're referring to. So you can hit command S to take a screenshot like that. It's gonna show up here and it's gonna slide away and appear on your desktop. Or you can just hit this button to take this screenshot as well. So there it goes. And then you hit this little image icon and you can choose that screenshot and send it to cursor as part of your prompt. And then you can say, hey, look at the screenshot. The percentage symbol is not to the right of the number. Can you just make sure it all looks formatted correctly? Something like that, right? It'll take up context when you're uploading new files like that, but I think you're gonna get better results, in my experience at least. Another helpful tip for uploading screenshots like that is when we get to the design and we want to show cursor what a result we want to achieve. Another way is you can add those screenshots, the design files into instructions, which is what I do. But for little bugs that I wanna give cursor context to, like, visual glitches. I usually don't save the screenshot into the project because it's just sort of like a temporary thing, whereas the designs are more permanent. Okay, so let's see if it fix this problem. The keyboard in iOS has always been a little finicky. I've seen some apps put a little button on the software keyboard that you can just tap to dismiss it because tapping outside the screen to dismiss the keyboard sometimes it's a hit or miss. So that's another option that we can explore. Okay, it's come up, yeah. So if I go like that, and I... all right, works, perfect. So don't forget to save state, either by copying your folder. As you can see, I, I didn't do it. So just based off of my experience in doing this stuff and understanding that this app isn't too complicated, I just sort of skipped that. But if you're starting out, you're doing this, you don't wanna lose your work, make sure you save along the way. And then when my GitHub video comes out, I'll reference it here and you can go watch that too. And you can learn how to use source control and do it like a developer would. And it's actually better than doing this multi-folder thing because it's the proper way to do things. So now you've just learned about creating a requirements document so that cursor can easily follow step-by-step -step how to build your app and what you want it to do. And number two, the three-step process to allow Cursor to build your app step-by-step. -step. And that is build, test, and save. Or BTS for short. Let's go with that. Now, the problem after you do all of that and you have your app built is that it's kind of plain looking. So we can fix that with AI as well. In the next part, I'm going to show you how to use AI to create a design and then how to implement that inside of Cursor. All right, I'll see you in the next part right over here.